Onc Live Insights is a video editorial program produced by Onc Live. The majority of CLL patients are diagnosed when they have relatively little tumor burden and no symptoms. Data from earlier studies showed that there was no benefit to early treatment in these patients. And that continues to be the case now, although there are some new studies reevaluating the question of early treatment in these earlier stage patients. Those won't read out for a very long time, however. So at present, these patients still qualify for a watch and wait approach. The reasons why I typically treat patients are several fold. The most common is the development of a low hemoglobin or low platelet count in the setting of increasing tumor burden in the blood and bone marrow. I do not treat patients just based on an elevated white count if they have no symptoms and no cytopenias. But once cytopenias start to develop and are clearly progressive, then that is the most common reason why I treat people. Patients who have large lymph nodes, that can also be a significant indication for therapy. Patients who have uncontrolled autoimmune cytopenias may also require therapy on that basis. The availability of the novel inhibitors has not had any effect on this. They are obviously highly active drugs in the relapse refractory setting, but our follow-up with them is still quite short compared to a potential of years or decades that a patient might be taking these drugs. <clears throat> At present, there are no data to suggest that treating patients who do not require treatment, who have low tumor burden, would be beneficial. In fact, there are some data on genetics of CLL that suggests the possibility that some of the adverse clones that we see coming out over time in these patients may be selected by treatment and are pre-existing. And so this could happen potentially even with the novel inhibitors. For this reason, I will really await the outcome of randomized trials showing an effect on overall survival before I would change my approach to these watch and wait patients. So the standard approach to when to initiate treatment and how to manage treatment um, has not significantly changed. Um, how to manage patients with CLL has, is changing and has evolved, but in terms of when, when to start treatment, um, the standard has been watch and wait until patients develop an indication to start treatment and then to start treatment once they have one of those indications. And I'll mention what those are in a second. Um, we have done in the past trials of early treatment where patients were randomly assigned to early treatment or no treatment, and those trials did not show an improvement in early treatment in terms of survival. Now, one of the, there's a couple problems with those old studies. One problem is that they assigned everybody, and we know that there are not an insignificant number of patients who never need treatment. So those trials were, um, they were uh, included patients that probably never would have needed treatment and if you include those patients it's difficult to appreciate an improvement in outcomes because their disease is indolent and um, they otherwise would not have needed treatment. The other issue with those older studies is that they were done in a time when we had less effective therapies. And so we think now that we have much more effective therapies, chemoimmunotherapy and these newer uh, small molecule inhibitors, we think that it will be easier to demonstrate an, an improvement in outcome. So when a patient receives a diagnosis of CLL, for the most part, most of the patients have early stage disease. They're incidentally noted to have an elevated lymphocyte count on a routine blood, um, blood test and then a diagnosis is made. So they usually don't have any symptoms. They usually don't have any nodes that they can feel. Um, perhaps a physician can feel them with their trained hands, but patient, patients typically at the time of diagnosis don't really have any s signs or symptoms that they have a problem. And the disease itself is such that usually they don't develop symptoms until the, they're much more advanced in their stage when there's a lot more disease present. Um, that's when they develop some of the symptoms that we associate with the disease. 
So patients are diagnosed typically at an early stage. We monitor and observe them until they develop an indication for treatment, and that's when we start treatment. Now, that's been the standard approach for years, back in the 80s and the 90s, and even now into this new era of chemoimmunotherapy and small molecule inhibitors. The standard criteria that we use or the things that we look for to determine whether or not a patient needs to start treatment are symptoms, and those symptoms usually are fatigue, and it has to be significant fatigue. For me, uh, patients with significant fatigue are patients who aren't doing what they were doing six months ago, patients who are curbing their recreational activities because they're too fatigued to be able to participate in regular exercise or um, uh, leisurely activities. Um, so fatigue is one, night sweats is another, and the night sweats need to be significant. They need to happen on a relatively regular basis and relatively frequently, at least once or twice or three times a week. And typically I won't start treatment until they're good drenching night sweats. Um, uh, and then the third and perhaps l l least um, common symptom is unintentional weight loss uh, or fever without evidence of infection. Uh, so those are the symptom, symptoms that we monitor for and we ask patients when they come in and if patients develop any of those that would be a trigger to have a discussion and start treatment planning. The other parameters we use are the blood counts. Now the white count isn't a trigger necessarily in and of itself as an indicator to start treatment. So I have patients who I allow their white count to rise up into the 100 and 200,000 uh, range. If they don't develop any of the other features that are triggers for treatment, then I'll watch them and not initiate therapy. If the white count is rapidly rising, if the doubling time, for example, is six months or less, that can be an indication for treatment, but it's very unusual for that in and of itself to be the only thing that we see. If a patient has rapidly rising white count or doubling, a short doubling time, they usually have something else that is also an indicator to start treatment, whether it's fatigue or uh, night sweats or um, one of the other blood parameters that we use. So a rapid doubling time is, um, is, a, is a, an indication that there is activity and that those are patients that I'm usually looking at a little bit closer and trying to determine whether or not they need treatment. Hemoglobin of less than 10 for me is what I use as a trigger to start treatment and it has to be consistently lower than 10. So there has to be two or three time points that I measure it that are separated by one to three months where I can clearly demonstrate that the hemoglobin is down and is declining and it's less than 10. And platelet count less than 100 is another trigger that we use to start treatment. And again, I usually will use more than one determination over a period of several months to say, okay, it's below 100 and it's time to start treatment now.